every expectant mother knows that what she eats impacts her baby. And now research shows that is also true for our cows. Maternal consumption of Reassure during late gestation had a positive effect on the in utero calf, setting her up for better health and potentially even higher milk production once she joins the milking string. Learn more at balchemanh.com slash launch and launch your herd for life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing for Balchem. Animal welfare has been a hot topic for decades, and the strides that uh, agriculture industry has made during that time have been significant. But as consumer scrutiny gets more intense, it's imperative that we keep moving forward to optimize animal care and animal welfare. For today's uh, Real Science uh, webinar, we are thrilled to have uh, one of the most well-known and respected names in animal welfare and animal behavior, Dr. Temple Grandin. Not only is Dr. Grandin an accomplished animal scientist, but also a world-renowned speaker about autism. Though we won't touch on that today, her lectures on autism have been life-changing for many families. But I'd now like to introduce Dr. Uh, Temple Grandin. Dr. Grandin is an American scientist and industrial designer whose um, own experience with autism funded her professional work in creating systems to counter stress in certain human and animal populations. Dr. Grandin is a prominent author and speaker on both autism and animal behavior. Today, she's a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. She also has a successful career consulting on both livestock handling equipment design and animal welfare. She's been featured on NPR and BBC. She's also appeared on national TV shows such as Larry King Live, 2020, 60 Minutes, Fox and Friends, and she has a TED Talk. Articles about Dr. Grand have appeared in Time Magazine, New York Times, Discover Magazine, Forbes, and USA Today. HBO has even made an Emmy Award-winning movie about her life, and she's been inducted into the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Grandin um, graduated with a bachelor's degree in uh, psychology from Franklin Pierce University in New Hampshire. She earned a master's degree in animal science from Arizona State University and a doctorate degree from the University of Illinois. Dr. Grandin, I've, I've gotten to know you just a little bit during uh, while we've been in the process of setting up this webinar. And one of the things not mentioned in your biography is that uh, you're, you're a very nice and a very kind person, and, and I've, I've enjoyed getting to know you. So it's, it's a real privilege to have you on the uh, Real Science Lecture Series stage. And so with that, uh, Dr. Grandin, the floor is now yours. Well, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here virtually, and I want to talk about the importance of stockmanship. I've been in the cattle industry for a lot of years, and when I first started back in the 70s, uh, cattle handling was really bad, and that is something that's gotten a whole lot better. A lot of the cattle associations are putting on workshops on low stress handling, um, big improvements in cattle handling. But it's something that you have to keep monitoring. It's sort of like traffic out on the highway. If the police didn't uh, put the speed cameras out there, you'd have a racetrack uh, out on the highway. Because if you have, because unfortunately, if you don't keep monitoring handling, it can have a tendency to sometimes slip back bad. My next slide shows a recent survey that was done at large Texas feed yards that shows that, yes, handling has improved. 70% um, of people don't scream and yell at cattle. Screaming and yelling at cattle is really bad because it has intent. They know you're mad at them. Uh, don't scream and yell at cattle. But you still had 30% of the people doing it. And another thing that I've been discussing for many, many years, especially on beef cattle handling, is not to overload the crowd pen that leads up to the single file chute. You still have a lot of people doing that because the good handling is going to require more walking. Standing in the wrong position, that's more of the finer points of handling. But handling is something you need to constantly monitor. Good stockmanship is important. You're going to get more productive dairy cows. There was a study that showed that people that scream at dairy cows and hit them, you actually are going to get lower milk production. That was some work done years ago by Paul Hemsworth. Now, my next slide shows a really funny pattern on a sidewalk. And what that is, it's eclipse shadows. And I noticed these weird shadows. I watched 
probably 100 students walk over this. This was on the sidewalk in front of our library at CSU. Most people didn't notice it. It's really important to become a good observer for little things in the environment because cattle notice little things that people tend to not notice. Now, the next slide is some work that was done by my student, Dennis Wilson. And uh, he looked at how the sun changed the shadows on a chute at, or a raceway at different times of day. Now, with beef cattle, you usually are only moving them to a facility maybe once or twice. They don't get trained to these shadows. Where in a dairy, you're going to have the new heifer that's going to stop at the shadow. And the old experienced cow, she's going to just walk over it. But the new heifer will stop. And what you need to do is give her a chance to look at the shadow, put her head down, wait until the head comes back up. Now, the next slide just says calm animals are much easier to handle. And that's just kind of a funny slide, a big old calm steer that you lead around with the feed bucket. And what people don't realize is if an animal gets scared and fearful, it takes 20 minutes for them to calm down. They can instantly get fearful, but it takes a long time to calm down. Now, right here, I think the cowboys probably just got hurt, but the horse would have been scared because a saddle all of a sudden fell off. You see, that's an example of a sudden novel experience. That can be scary to animals. I'm going to be talking more about that later. Now, the next slide, I talk about um, signs of fear in cattle and horses. Now, the first thing that all cattle do, dairy cattle, beef cattle, it, they, they see something that looks a little different. They put the head up, the alert head. Ears will get pinned back. Now, if cattle start uh, defecating, you know, making manure, we call it pooping, making manure uh, while you're handling them, that's an, a, a sign that they're getting stressed because you're just scaring the manure out of them. Another sign that they're getting stressed is tail switching, just switching their tail back and forth. Horses also do that. A dog, when they're switching their tail, they're happy, but in cattle, they're not. And when you see eye white, they are really scared. Now, this research on the eye white was done in beef cattle. Now, on some of the Holstein cattle, just the way their eye is made, uh, you can sometimes see eye white when, when there's nothing wrong at all, but it's just the way the cow's eye is made. But getting scared is sort of a hierarchy from just alerting at something to um, getting ready to get completely going berserk. And it's good for people to recognize these signs like the, like the defecation, scientific word for manuring, and tail switching, because they can, these can give you a warning of she's getting ready to kick your head off. The next slide shows an example of a very bad situation in a handling facility. The animals are going straight into the blinding sun. You know, if you're trying to load a trailer with some heifers uh, in the morning and the sun is coming up over that trailer, you're going to have a horrible time. You might want to wait until the sun is not blinding in your eyes. You've all driven down the road where the sun blinds you. Um, and, you know, then maybe 30 minutes later, everything's fine. Now, cattle have a tendency to move towards the light, but they're not going to go into blinding light like this. The next slide shows some little distractions. Now, um, my host here mentioned that I was autistic, and I often get asked how that helped me understand animals. I think in pictures. I am an extreme visual thinker. So in my very early work with cattle, this is back in the 70s, I looked at what cattle were looking at. And you can see a vehicle through the fence with a reflection on it. There's a little white jug there. There's a little tiny piece of red string. Cattle tend to notice these little things that people tend to not notice. And you bring an animal up calmly, they might look right at that little piece of moving string. Now, in a dairy situation, it's probably only going to be the new heifers that are going to stop at these things because they haven't learned that they're not going to hurt them. The experienced cow is just going to walk right by them. But oftentimes, if you take these little distractions out of a, out of a facility, um, your handling is going to be a whole lot better. Little things that people don't notice, cattle notice. The next slide shows a chain hanging down in a raceway. And a little wiggling chain. And you tie that up. You get it out of the way. Then they're going to move just fine. 
And my next slide shows what I call the dark movie theater effect. Now, I, I noticed in your advertisement that you do a lot of work with dairy cattle, and I'm showing a lot of pictures that show beef cattle examples. These principles that I am telling you apply to all cattle. The main difference between the beef cattle and the dairy cattle is the beef cattle don't have time to learn the facility, where the dairy cattle do. So you're mainly going to see the things I'm talking about, the new heifers, when they first go into the facility. Well, this is a veterinary facility at a beef feed yard, sunny outside, dark inside. That can be a really bad situation for getting them in. This was a milking parlor. Your new heifers are going to be stopping and refusing to move. Now, one of the ways you can fix this is to, um, and the next slide shows it, is install white translucent panels so that they can see natural light through the building. I saw a very nice milking parlor one time where the whole top section on the sidewalls was white tra translucent panels so that when the dairy cows went in there, it was like a bright sunny day and they used white translucent panels so that it had no shadows, really, really nice lighting. Now my next slide shows some cattle stopping at a puddle. And what you wanna do is let that leader stop, put the head down, wait for it to bring the head back up, then you push them. If you push a heifer when she stops and puts her head down to a drain, she's gonna turn them back on you. Give that new heifer a chance to look at that drain wait for that head to come back up, and then you can push her. The next slide just shows a backstop gate. Now, beef type facilities are often used on, uh, on uh, younger dairy stock, and a lot of them have these backstop gates. Cattle don't like going through these things. And if you hook it up with a remote control rope, you can hold it open for the cattle. Very, very simple change. The next slide emphasizes the importance of moving small groups of, of cattle. Big mistake when we're handling cattle through a veterinary facility is bringing up these big, huge groups, stuffing your crowd pen full, and then they all turn around on you. All cattle have a tendency to go back to where they came from. And one of the things that's really important in good stockmanship is moving small groups. Now, obviously, going into a milking parlor, you're bringing up a great big, huge group. But you see, those animals have become trained. You see, that's very different from, uh, let's say, it's some young heifers, and you're going to run them just through the uh, single file chute, and you're going to vaccinate them. Uh, in that situation, you'd want to bring up small groups. Also, a lot of dairies now are doing what's called beef on dairy, where they're breeding cows to Angus bulls to produce really nice beef animals. And you have to handle those in you know, beef type facilities. But good handling in many cases, especially around a veterinary issue, is going to require uh, more walking. And I've got a funny slide there of walking two dogs. Um, and this is something that has to be monitored. What you need to figure out in your facility is what is the correct amount of animals to bring up that works under your conditions. And the next slide shows one place you do need a solid gate. Um, they have that tendency to go back. Now, handling is going to go so much easier if you wait until you have some space in your single file race. Then you fill up the crowd pen, and then the cattle just keep going and enter the single file race. I call that timing your bunches. Now, the next slide very nicely shows the flight zone in a whole flock of sheep. And if you can get big herds of cattle, you can see the same thing. Now, dairy cattle, a lot of them are very tame. You're not going to see this big bubble. But the things I'm going to show you, even though it shows beef examples, these same principles apply. You're just going to be able to get a lot closer to the animals because the flight zone is smaller. So there's three things that determine the flight zone. Amount of contact with people. Genetics the more genetically flighty animals will have a bigger flight zone and the quality of the contact, quiet versus gentle. Now I've been to dairies where um, you walk up to the uh, milking cows and they come up to you. And I've been to dairies where a strange person comes up and they run to the other end of the alley. And one of my students, uh, Wendy Fulwider, she's got a paper on this, 
found that those cattle that run away from you, run away from strange people, had a higher somatic cell count. So this is another thing that shows very clearly that's good stockmanship pays. I just cannot emphasize that enough. So you can kind of see this bubble. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide. And right here was some beef cattle that have a moderate sized flight zone. The people are standing in right in the correct location. So the cattle just kind of circle around them. And I have videos on grandon.com, grandon.com, just my last name, a whole video library. I've got the my videos, but I also have picked out some videos from other people that I really like. And there's one really good dairy video on on there that's not mine, but it's a very, very nice uh, a dairy video. But here, you're, they're just letting the animals flow. And the people are just doing little tiny movements. You see, people feel they got to get up there, wave their arms. And, and some people who are teaching low stress handling are recommending out in the pens not to use driving aids because people flap them around too much. But that just shows really nice handling. And there is a video of that on grandon.com. The next slide is a little bit of a complicated diagram. And I'll be talking about some other things that will make it easier to understand. But there's actually two zones. You have the flight zone where you walk up to the cattle and they move away. And then you have a zone around the flight zone where they'll turn around and look at you. Now, one of the problems we've got in low stress handling is that people have different names for these things. Flight zone is usually pretty much the same, but that other zone where they turn and look at you, they might call it the zone of awareness, the zone of influence, turn around and look at you, pressure zone, but it all means the same thing. Now you can see a dotted line there that's curved and that would symbol symbolize a single file raceway. And you can also see a line at the shoulder and a line at the eye. Now, when you're right up close to cattle in the single file race, if you want that animal to go forward, you have to be behind the shoulder. A common mistake I see being made in single file races is to stand at the head of an animal and poke it on the rear end. That does not work. You're telling it to go forward and back at the same time. Now, the next slide very clearly shows the two different zones. You can see when I walked up to those um, Angus cattle, they moved away. That's the flight zone. But then I have a tan animal there in the background. He's looking at me. He knows I'm there. Doesn't think he has to get up, but he knows I'm there. You see, that's that other zone that some people call the zone of awareness, pressure zone, or zone of influence. And then there's some cattle just eating in the feed trough, and I'm too far away to affect their behavior. So I kind of got three zones here. The zone where I have no effect on their behavior, the zone where they'll turn around and look at me, and then the zone where I move into it and they'll move away. Now, if you work with animals and you're quiet with them, you can gradually reduce the flight zone. Now, you can also get cattle that have absolutely no flight zone at all. And that can sometimes get dangerous because you might be going out to feed them and they're mobbing and shopping and pushing around a small vehicle that you're on. That can be dangerous. And you wanna make sure you do not accidentally reward this behavior. If I put the feed down when they're pushing and shoving, then I have accidentally rewarded pushing and shoving. What I wanna do with these really tame cattle is I put the feed down when they're polite and they stand back a little bit. I want to reward polite behavior. Or if you're doing pasture rotation, grass dairy, you don't want the mobbing and pushing around at the gate. So I'm not going to open the gate for the next pasture until they stop pushing on me. I want to reward the polite behavior in really, really tame animals. Now the next slide just shows a handy movement pattern uh, where you quickly walk back by the animal to make it move forward. This even works for tame dairy cattle. And it's kind of counterintuitive. You move back quickly in the opposite direction of desired motion. Now, you've, I give you permission to take this diagram off the slides and use that with um, training some of your clients. That'll be just fine. But this is a really important little thing that can really help handling. The next slide shows a beef facility in Australia where I have a solid outer wall. That prevents the cattle from seeing all the trucks and vehicles that you've parked alongside it. 
But when you've got a see-through fence with animals that have a flight zone, you want to imagine that there's kind of a bubble or a force field that comes out through that fence. And if you stand there inside that flight zone, you might have an animal rear up or maybe an animal is going to raise its tail and start manuring um, and switch its tail around and because you're starting to scare it. Now, what you want to do in that situation is back up out of that flight zone. So the next um, slide just shows a truck that the cattle can see as they come up the chute. Uh, when I went to this place, they had two identical cattle handling facilities, one that worked well, one that did not work very well. And this is the one that did not work well because it had the view of the truck. And when I pointed it out, the people would go, oh, we didn't see that. Okay, this gets back to observation. This is where I need a solid wall of a building to block the view of that truck. The next slide just shows an animal rearing up. And that animal is rearing up because that handler is standing too close. He needs to back up and get out of the flight zone. That's what he needs to do. Only time he should be in the flight zone is when he enters it to move the animal. You do have to enter it to move the animal or to do that movement pattern. The next slide asks, well, how long should I make my single file race? You want to have it long enough to get some following behavior. And, um, you know, so you can put three or four cattle in there and have them follow. The next slide shows a little handy way to um, get high flight zone cattle to enter a squeeze chute, or as you call it in Australia, a crush more easily. Because if they can see the operator standing there, then they're not going to want to go in. And now some of the real fancy new hydraulic squeeze chutes have um, uh, the hydraulic controls on a swing arm so that the operator can stand out further away. But you might want to try just putting a piece of cardboard on the back half of it so they don't see the operator as they come in. And this next slide shows some data that was uh, collected down in Brazil out on a large cattle ranch. And they lowered the stress hormone, the cortisol, by putting a piece of cardboard on, stopping the yelling. I can't emphasize enough the stopping of the yelling at, at cattle. You know, just regular talking is fine, but yelling, they know you're mad at them. They pick up on that. Also, with dairy cattle, there was an old study done years ago by a scientist named Seabrook, and he found that a calm, confident person was really good at working with the dairy cows. They recognize if you're confident. And dogs in the corrals I don't like, and when it comes to electric prods, you should not be using them as your primary driving tool. I'm not going to suggest banning them, but get them out of your hands. Only use them when you absolutely have to. Let's go to the next slide. There's been a lot of discussion in low stress handling, especially in the beef cattle world, whether I should have solid sides or open sides on uh, the raceway. Now, I've been in this industry for a lot of years, and back in the 70s, a lot of the cattle we had were a whole lot wilder than the cattle we have now, because we now have done 25 years of temperament selection. Now, if you have an open side, you've got to keep away from it until it's ready. you're ready to move the animals. And it requires more stockmanship skill. If you've got wild cattle, less skilled people, then you might want to go the solid side route. But the most important part to cover is outer perimeters, so they don't see all the vehicles. Now, the next slide shows some curved systems that I have designed, and, uh, and they've got to be laid out right. I have a lot of information on Grandin.com. I also have information in my book on humane livestock handling. Amazon's got lots of copies of that because there's been discussions about different types of designs. And the thing I can't emphasize enough is it's got to be laid out correctly. It has to be. And I'm going to show you some layout tips we can go on to the next slide. Now, this shows the right and the wrong way to lay out a curved system with a round tub crowd pen and a, cur a curved single file race. The dotted line is wrong because when that animal stands to go into that raceway, he needs to be able to see a place to go. And, and 12 foot um, or 3.5 meter radius will work well. Do not make a bigger gate on there. Layout's important. Uh, and unfortunately, there's designs online of some really badly laid out stuff. I won't say whose websites those are, but um, things have to be laid out right. 
Let's go on the next slide. Now, this is a very simple little design that you can make with portable panels. We've got a lot of people now, a lot of rented land using portable panels. Very simple, solid on the outside. And the round pen works because as they go back, because they want to go back to where they come from. So they come on around the round crowd pen, going back to where they come from. And you just work there right at the pivot point at the gate. Maybe take a little flag and you can just guide the cattle right around that. Very simple. You can lay that out with portable panels. And then the next slide shows another simple um, design that you can make with portable panels. And then for the smaller farms, especially for portable panels, I have another book, um, Temple Granite's Guide to Working with Farm Animals. Solid on the outer radius. Um, I, but the layout is right. The most critical part of the layout is where your single file race joins the crowding area where the cattle have to go from a group down to single file. We go to the next slide. Now I get asked all the time about the bud box and there gets to be a controversy or a lot of discussion about should I use a bud box or use a tub. Now both systems work but they've got to be laid out right and there's bud box uh, drawings online that are wrong and there's tub and round crowd pen drawings that are wrong. Now this is going to require more skill to operate because the way it works is you put the cattle in the box and then you stand inside the box, they circle around you and go up the single file chute. Now, one of the things you must not do with this is store cattle in there. What you put in the box must immediately come back around and go into the chute. What you put in the box has to fit in the chute or the race. Okay, I've got to make sure for the translation program, a chute and race actually mean exactly the same thing. Let's go to the next slide. And how about driving aid? I like these little flags. Uh, one of the things I like about them is you, see, you cannot hit cattle hard with them. But what you want to do with this little flag is just use it to guide the cattle. I especially like that when you're moving them in crowd pens. And we can go to the next slide. Did some work on um, reducing electric pride use. And yes, and when people do that, um, you're going to have less problems with cattle falling down, uh, mooing, you know, during handling. The next slide just shows some um, curved single file chute designs uh, just to show, show some things off. Now, the next slide, I discuss two different design concepts. I can make something that's very simple, very inexpensive, easy to build, economical like the bud box, but it requires more stockmanship skill. I'm going to call that very economical but skill dependent. Or I can make around a crowd pen design, more expensive, but it's easier for less skilled people to use. I'd recommend that, especially if you've got employee turnover. Let's go to the next slide. Here are some other good behavioral principles of restraint. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of non-slip flooring. Animals get all scared and frightened when they start slipping and get hard to handle. And the problem with flooring is it wears out. And when I go in to do a welfare inspection of different farms, a flooring that's been allowed to wear out and become slippery and slick is a major problem. Also, with hydraulic restraint devices, you must be careful not to squeeze animals too hard. Uh, there's a tendency to squeeze them too hard. If an animal vocalizes, Whoo! when you put a hydraulic uh, pressure on them, it's too tight. Also, the blocking the vision. And we'll go on to the next slide. Again, another non-slip flooring coming out of the uh, head stanchion. All right, now let's see how good your observation skills are. Now, if I had you there in the audience, I'd be asking you to raise your hand if you saw that that animal was looking at the sunbeam. Now that I've pointed it out, it seems obvious. But I find if I show this to school children, they see it. But a lot of adults don't see this. Let's go to the next slide. Now, this shows data handling. This is based on our beef quality assurance program here in the, in the U.S. Cattle handling measurements. You manage the things that you measure. It's just that simple. And so you measure things. Well, how often does you use an electric prod? I can remember in the past when cattle handling was terrible, people were using it multiple times on each animal. So the average for some large feedlots was only 5%. That's a good score. That's 
excellent. Vocalization during handling, which is mooing and bellering, you should be able to get an animal into a head stanchion or head bail, head restraint, squeeze shoot or crush restrainer, and they should not be vocalized, period. Vocalizing and probably hurting them. Then we measure falling when they exit. That should be very low, 0.8%. Stumbling, which would be going down on the knee. Miscaught, maybe the head restraint catches them across the shoulders because they didn't operate it right. And this running when you let them out. These are things I can measure. And I'm a big proponent of measurement because then I can tell, is my handling getting better or is my handling getting worse? You know, and these scoring systems have been used with great success in feed yards, large meat plants, ranches have been using this. It's part of our beef quality assurance. Now, the next slide shows um, temperament testing. And uh, we did some of the first work on that. And we found that cattle that go really crazy and fight against a squeeze shoot when they're restrained had lower weight gains. So for 25 years, we've been, we've been temperament testing beef cattle. And the cattle we have now are a lot calmer. Now, the next slide, I want to talk about how we can have different traits in animals. These are the core emotions, and all mammals have this. You have fear, and this is out of the neuroscience literature. You have fear. You have anger. Usually, that's not a problem in cattle, except maybe a bull. Uh, separation distress. Separation distress and fear are separate emotional systems. Separation distress is when one cow's away from her herd mates, when a calf is away from the mother. And then you have the urge to seek or explore. There's been some very interesting work done with grazing with GPS collars at the um, New Mexico State University. And some animals will go out and get a lot of pasture and others don't. And then, of course, you have the sex drive. You've got mother young nurturing. as She bothered the liquor calf and play. And the next slide, I'm just talking about how both genetics and experience affects these things. Now, one of the problems we have in scientific literature is different terminology. High and low fear in some studies is called shy and bold. It means the same thing. Or high and low seek is called exploration, how much they explore. And there's one paper that calls them a go-getter and a laid back. You can actually look that paper up online with those key words. Let's go to the next slide. I want to warn you, do not over-select for, for any trait. You don't want to end up having the cattle equivalent of the bulldog. It can't breathe, it can't walk, it can't have its babies naturally. You over-select for any trait, whether it's appearance, production, uh, or uh, you will end up wrecking your animal. Just, just that simple. Um, there are differences in, in beef cattle on whether how much how protective they are of their calf. Now, you don't want a mother who just ignores her calf. You certainly don't want her. The next slide shows purebred Brahmin. And it just shows that when uh, you're nice to these cattle, they really like being stroked. Working with animals. Don't pat an animal like this. Stroke it. Stroke it. Make it feel like the mother's tongue. That works a lot better than just patting it. They interpret that as hitting. The next slide just uh, shows uh, different levels of stress hormone cortisol uh, during handling. Uh, when you force an animal to do something, you get a lot more fear stress compared to an animal voluntarily cooperating with you when you handle it. So those top graphs up there's beef cattle, the bad old days, lots of electric prodders, um, just forcing it. And then dairy cows are lower. And the reason for that is they are a trained animal. They voluntarily go into the milking parlor. And then also work with antelopes that we trained. And we got very, very low cortisol. We can go to the next slide. It's very, very important that an animal's first experience with something new, like the milking parlor or a trailer, is a good first experience. Because if it's first experience with that new person, piece of equipment or place is bad, they don't forget it. And they may never want to go in there again. The next slide just shows some of the studies that show the importance <coughs> of good stockmanship. Really important. And I should have also put in there that Hemsworth 
study on dairy cows and Wendy Fulwider's paper on the somatic cell count. Animals that have a big flight zone that are afraid of people have lower productivity. Lots of advantages to good stockmanship. It's very well supported in the literature. There's got another slide there that shows even more examples of uh, you know, why good stockmanship is important. Now, the thing I have found is people want the new thing, the new milking parlor, the new handling facility. They want the thing more than they want the management. That's a very, very basic thing. They'll go out and buy the fancy new parlor, but then be hitting cattle in it. And when I first started, when I was in my 20s, um, I made the mistake of um, thinking I could make a self-managing cattle handling facility. That is rubbish. And we've got all kinds of new technologies coming in. Those are not going to replace management. Now, the thing about something new, like a camera case, you put that out in the pasture, and the cows will just come up to that. You see, something new is attractive when the animal can voluntarily approach. And it's scary when you suddenly shove it in their face. That's a very, very basic, basic principle. And it interacts with genetics. The animal with the flighty genetics would have a bigger reaction if you suddenly scared it with something new than an animal with calmer genetics. Now, the next slide, just talks about how animal thinking actually is in pictures. It's specific. For example, the flight zone of the cattle might be a very, very small to a truck bringing feed out. But then when you get on foot, that's a different picture. The flight zone will get bigger. If I train an animal to tolerate a blue and white umbrella suddenly opening, that does not transfer to a piece of cloth just flapping around. And now the next slide just shows the pieces of cloth and the umbrella. Think about it. That uh, tarp, and we call that a tarp. I'm not sure if that word translates on the automatic translation, but it's a big piece of plastic cloth that you put over things like for cargo or put it over hay. And um, that looks very different than an umbrella, you see, because the animal stores it as a picture. Now, I want to give you another example here, the next slide, of how an animal stores something as a picture. This is a children's play set. And my student, Megan Corgan, took young colts and young fillies and walked them by this 15 times. It's all done in a walk until the horse no longer stopped, put the head up, or flared the nostrils. And when that play set was rotated, it became a new object. You see how that play set looks different? When it's rotated, it looks like a different object. Where, since most people think in verbal, they're going to go, that's a kid's toy. Well, the cow doesn't do that. Let's go to the next slide. Man on the horse, man on the ground. Cattle view that as two different things. They need to be habituated to both. Um, it's a good idea to get cattle habituated to different people. So if your milker is off, uh, they're not going to get upset when someone new comes in. Different people, different vehicles, get them used to a whole lot of different things. And then the world is less novel and less scary. Next slide shows a dog where I absolutely don't want it around the chutes. Because when they bite cattle in the chutes, that trains cattle to kick. And I've nearly had my head kicked off twice by cattle bitten by dogs in the chute. Or excuse me, in the raceway, whatever you want to call it. Same thing. Now, then I get asked, is it okay to have a border collie out in the field? Yes, I have seen that done well in the field. But this blue healer here biting around the single file race, I hate that. The next slide, I just talk about the importance of getting animals accustomed to different people and different things. Just really, really important. Okay, if you're showing show animals over and over again, I've had people say, well, my cow was calm at home and she went crazy at the show or my steer went crazy at the show well you have a lot of new things at shows that you don't have at home like flags bikes balloons now we got a new one drones yeah that's the new one we're gonna have to worry about now the next slide just emphasizes that we manage things that we measure and i already talked some about the measurement system and the next slide just reviews the um, scoring system for handling. 
Uh, now that's the same system that was on that other slide, things to measure. And um, I can measure two things with this. I can measure as whether or not my handling's gotten better or maybe it got worse, but I can also see differences between different kinds of cattle. Because the next slide just shows differences in ease of handling between two different groups of cattle. And um, there are differences. And, uh, and some cattle are much harder to handle than other cattle. And I do a lot of work with the meat packing plants and there's a point where there's some cattle coming in that's so dangerous to handle, something needs to be done about it, getting them more acclimated. Next slide just shows very, very simple things that I did with equipment modifications. For example, I reduced pressure on the neck from a head stanchion. And when I did that, the vocalization score went down. Or I installed a light on the race entrance so it wasn't dark. And then they vocalized less because they weren't being poked with an electric prodder. And then go on to the next slide. Um, this just shows um, um, animal welfare audits I did with McDonald's and how we got huge improvements when they were getting inspected by McDonald's. And most of these improvements were due to management, management and repair of equipment and fixing things like non-slip floor. I want to go through these quickly so we stay pretty much in the time, have some time for questions. The next slide, um, when I'm designing these measurement systems, it's not a paperwork audit. It's looking at observable things like vocalization electric pride use, falling down during handling. You know, those are things that I can measure. It's the same principles used in food safety. Now let's look at some of the critical control points for welfare on the next slide. Um, and when you're auditing welfare, I put the emphasis on what's called an outcome-based measure. The OIE calls it an animal-based outcome measure. So I'm not going to tell you how to build a dairy stall. But if your dairy cubicle or, or free stall has problems, you might have lameness or you might have swollen joints. That would be an outcome. And then there's some practices we just out and out prohibit and getting away from things, the input-based things, like I'm going to tell you exactly how to build equipment. Let's go to the next slide. And this shows the critical control points, especially for dairy, handling scoring, swollen joints, that's often caused by housing problems, lameness. Now, the interesting thing about lameness in dairy cattle is it got up to 25% because people weren't seeing it. Because if you ask a dairy producer to um, estimate how many lame cattle he's got, he'll underestimate by half, three different studies, dirty cows, skinny body condition, ammonia levels in indoor barns, uh, heat stress, open mouth breathing in cattle. And this is a problem in dark hided cattle outdoor feed yards. If they're breathing with their mouth open, they're too hot, period. And coat condition. You know, that's more of an issue in some of the organic facilities. Now, I want to just put up here that lameness is a really good critical control point. On the next slide, I show, because look at all the things that could make them lame. You see, it's the measure that, that will pinpoint that you have a problem. This slide lists all the different things that make the cow lame, such as a leg conformation, a hoof trimming, hoof care, foot diseases, injuries, you know, various different things. Go to the next slide. It's very important to select cattle for good leg conformation. I cannot emphasize this enough. And when pigs and beef cattle were just selected for meat, you ended up with a straight legs or a collapsed ankle where they walked on the dew claws. And this is genetics. Traits can sometimes be linked. The next slide shows a dreadful steer that I saw at a steer show. And his legs are so straight, that's called post-legged, that if he was a bull, he would not be able to breed very many cattle because he's not going to be able to walk. And then my next slide shows a very bad pig. And this is genetic. And I've seen this kind of very bad ankle also in cattle. And it, this was caused by breeding the animals strictly for meat traits and doing it indiscriminately. I think we have to start looking at what is the optimal thing to do? We have some problems now with milk production. We've bred so much from milk production, the cow has difficulty breeding. I think we have to look at an animal, well, look at genetics selection, sort of like a national budget. If I put all of the national budget into the economy, that'd be milk or meat, then maybe I don't have enough 
for infrastructure, like the legs and the reproduction, or maybe I'm going to hurt my military, which is the ability to fight disease. So we got to take a more balanced view, and breeders are starting to do that. The next slide shows a very bad foot. That's genetic. And then, of course, the next slide, I'm going to show you some of the things we never do. Poking sensitive areas, dragging downers. I got a video on proper use of livestock driving tools. And then with a very fake plastic pig, I'm going to show you what you don't do. It's kind of a funny video. Proper use of livestock driver driving tools. And I'll give you some examples of some input measures, because sometimes you need to use those. Uh, like maybe feeder and water space. So let's just look at the end thing on things to improve welfare. Now, the most important thing in the next slide is I got to make sure that on my dairy or my beef operation, I don't have acts of abuse. You need to remember this. It's everywhere. And you think you can get rid of this? It's everywhere. And don't do anything that you wouldn't want filmed on a phone and post it online. Uh, they're everywhere. You're not going to control phones. They're everywhere, and they're taking pictures. And don't do anything you'd be embarrassed. And we've got to eliminate you know, acts of abuse or you know, horribly neglected health problems that I want to implement the numerical scoring, handling, lameness, body condition score, dirty, uh, broken tails. That's been a problem at some dairies. Now, highly motivated behavioral needs. This is a bigger problem for animals such as laying hens and for pigs in, in intense uh, confined situations. Less of a problem in dairies. But there's getting to be a growing movement in welfare where people are getting more and more concerned about um, taking the calf away from the mother cow, getting more and more emails about that, and confinement where they don't get to go outside. Now, the first step I got to do is I got to prevent a, a suffering. I got to prevent suffering. But now, does the animal have a chance for positive emotions? You want to see a positive emotion in a dairy cow? You go on YouTube and watch those dairy cows using those motorized grooming brushes. They love them. I'm not supposed to say as a scientist that cow loves something. But let me tell you, after you watch these videos, they love them. And the last slide just shows my... Um, Brandon.com. I got lots of information on that. Feel free to translate it into other languages. And it's been great talking to you. And I hope we've got some time for some questions. Yes, we absolutely do, Dr. Brandon. And thank you very much. Uh, before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video. And then we'll be right back to answer the, quest, uh, the questions uh, submitted during today's presentation. The heat of summer is coming, and it can have a big impact on your cows. Niacher Precision Release Niacin is the perfect complement to traditional heat abatement strategies to help keep her cool from the inside. Using Balcom's proprietary encapsulation process, Niacher delivers eight times more bioavailability than raw niacin, leading to an increase in sweating and vasodilation to reduce internal body temperature and support maximum productivity. Learn more at balcamanh.com slash cool and keep her cool from the inside. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Uh, Dr. Granning, your first question comes in from Pete. And he'd like to know what is the best way to determine the correct number of animals to work as a single group? Uh, okay, first of all, I need to know, are we talking about cows going to the milking parlor or are we talking more of the beef cattle situation uh, coming up uh, uh, to put in the crowding area before you go in single file raceway? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to uh, call an audible here and say it's, it's I, in, in the uh, holding pin um, to the parlor. Well, the problem is it depends upon the design of the parlor. And there tends to be uh, a tendency to overcrowd with crowd gates. Um, uh, this is where you need to take your time on acclimating your heifers. Now, I think, you know, I've been around now for 50 years. And when I started out in Arizona, everybody fed their dairy cows in the parlor. Everybody did. Then we phased that out. 
Now some of the research is showing that may have been a mistake because that new heifer is going to be much more willing to go in there uh, if she gets some yummy grain while she's in there. And, and then, then some of the parallel designs, some of the parallel designs, I, I'd be hard to feed in those. Um, but it, it, the thing you don't want to do is just overcrowd them. Hopefully, they're going to come in there voluntarily and you don't have to use the crowd gate. Now, one thing I absolutely don't want to see is electric wire on, the, on those pusher gates. No, 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 no. Don't put electric wire on that. And, and the other thing is taking the time to acclimate new heifers. Now, there's been some studies that have shown that if you acclimate heifers and um, uh, you don't feed them, then they kind of, you know, this is before they freshen, then they kind of decide they don't want to go in there. I go into a lot more detail on these things in my book, Improving Animal Welfare, a Practical Approach. Got pigs on the cover, but got plenty of stuff in there about dairy animals. Um, now, in a beef situation, I... Uh, you don't what, what one of the things you don't want to do is i fill up the crowd pen with cattle and the single file raceway is full and then everybody turns around that's what i don't want to do and then they're very difficult to get out of there so again you need to figure out in your facility to correct them out usually it would be filling the crowding pen half to no more than three quarters full and timing your bunches good handling in a in for beef cattle going through a vaccinating shoot is going to require more walking. It's, it's just that simple. Uh, but the stockmanship matters, regardless of what you have for a milking parlor. Another thing that's really important is don't understaff and overwork. If people get too tired, they get too tired to do good handling. Mm -hmm. That's when the yelling and the slapping and the tail twisting and all that stuff starts. Yeah, good point. Uh, thank you for that. The next question comes in from Laura. It says, uh, Dr. Grandin, the challenge is helping the people in charge understand that there is room for improvement. What is your advice on best ways to start the conversation with employees? If you uh, agree, where is a good place to start on the dairy farm? Well, first of all, top management has to decide that they're going to have good handling. I have found everything that I worked on, top management has to have buy-in. Because when well, I can remember early in my career, I'd go out and train people to handle cattle right. And as soon as I left, they were hitting them and screaming them at, at them again. Top management has to decide that they are going to change how they do things and be really committed to it. Also, to learn good stockmanship, let's say going in and out of the parlor, uh, you're going to be slower in the beginning. It's going to take time to learn. And a lot of people don't want to take that time. There's an old thing in exercise. They say no pain, no gain. So when you first start doing it, you know, things are going to be slowed down. Um, and everyone has to be committed to having better handling. Again, I said people want the fancy new parlor. Or we're going to get all these electronic monitoring devices. That doesn't replace management. I want to say a word about electronic monitoring devices. I've got a student that got uh, data from three different types of monitoring devices, an accelerometer bracelet, um, all the milking parameters off of that, and then some, another monitoring device, three different vendors, none of the computer interfaces talk to each other. And using the data was a nightmare, horrible. Uh, the thing that's unfortunate is this dairy spent all this money on this equipment and, it's, and it doesn't have a computer interface that that dairy producer can actually use. And uh, my student um, also learned an interesting thing about new heifers. This is Daniel Witchman. That um, okay, okay, is she going to kick the milker and hurt the milker? She's likely to do it on the third day after she freshens, when she started to get a little bit sore. Then she kicks the, kicks you. That's one of the things we learned from the data after going through painstaking manual inputting of the data into spreadsheets. Yeah. No, these vendors need to do a much better job on their interfaces to get them usable. Yeah, thank you for that. My next question comes in from Rand, and he wants to know if there's any research or experience regarding uh, cow welfare using different kinds of uh, milking parlors, whether it's rotating, herringbone, or parallel. Not really. And all three of those can work. Parallel is a little bit harder to train the cow to it. Um, they... Uh, they all can work. And I can't emphasize enough maintenance of equipment, 
Are you checking all your vacuums, all your maintenance stuff? Yep. They want the thing. We're going to buy the magic new thing that's going to solve all our problems. Yep. And then, of course, there are systems that are undersized and something that's just not going to work. Right. Makes sense. The next question comes in from Caitlin. Moving into the summer, do you have any recommendations or resources to help keep dairy cows moving calmly to and from the parlor in the heat? Well, they don't want to move. You see, that's that's part of the problem. They're hot. And and um, I don't think this may not be relevant. A lot of places um, you go down to the Yucatan of Mexico, and they've got a Brahman cross Holstein doesn't get hot. Now, of course, it doesn't give as much milk. Or if you're going to have, uh, well, in Arizona, I lived in Arizona for years, and dairy cows are giving a lot more milk now. You know, maybe it's, we have two ways. You can put them all inside, and that's going to get criticized. Or um, maybe we back off a tiny bit on the milk production. Because mm -hmm. Cora Akama, another one of my students, has a brand new paper that she did reviewing the literature on utter edema, which is a non-infectious, you know, so lymphatic fluid swelling in the udder. And she found that um, sometimes it makes them a little more touchy when you're milking, a little more painful. Uh, maybe on some of this milk production, we have to back off just a little bit. Think about genetics being like a national budget. If I put it all into the economy, which would be milk, well, then how about my legs? How about reproduction, which has gotten bad? How about disease resistance? Maybe we have to look at what we do optimal, mm -hmm. optimal, optimal, not maximum. It's just mm -hmm. like the lameness thing. It got up to 25% before people realized they need to do something about it. And that's what I call bad becoming normal. They got so used to seeing lame cows, they didn't see them. And then when it was actually measured, they were shocked at how many lame cows they had. It does seem like balance is a secret to everything, doesn't it? Well, on a lot of things, it is, yeah. and and um, and I've seen, uh, and then you want to see the ultimate uh, genetic uh, selection horribleness. Yeah. It's the bulldog. Yeah, can't breathe, can't walk, can't have its babies naturally. Next question comes in from Gloita. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, I don't work with cattle, but with wildlife welfare. Uh, I think much of what you said could be relevant to what I'm doing. Um, which of your books would you recommend as the best follow-up to your talk today? Well, for wildlife, um, I've got I've got um, one of my books is uh, I have Animals in Translation, and also you might like um, Animals Make Us Human. Animals in Translation, Animals Make Us Human. In Animals in Translation, I discuss how visual thinking helped me in my work with uh, with animals. Now, the thing about the wildlife is they're much more flighty. And um, I've got papers online where we trained antelopes to cooperate with um, having injections and blood draws. And nobody thought that would be possible. Now, the thing with these antelopes is they're super flighty. So something like teaching them to tolerate a door opening took 10 days because if I suddenly opened the, a door, they would slam into the wall and might get in, injured. You see, this animal is a very, uh, very, and they're very specific in the, in their thinking. With some other antelopes um, that we worked on, um, we had them train so that the student could walk up and do a juggler stick right here, just fine. Walk up to them and do it. But then she decided to do an injection in the shoulder, and they went for shark. Hmm. You see, this is how specific they're thinking. It's a specific touch sensation, a specific picture. So this, they learned, we're trained as okay. This was something new, went crazy, hit the fence. Okay. Uh, the next question comes in. Um, looks from Carlos, University of Milan. He has two questions. Um, in Italy, we have all, the, uh, all of the shoots without the squeeze. Uh, I believe and advise that squeeze is fundamental. Please, can you help me clarify if it is true? If you're in a dairy and your cattle are really tame, then you probably don't need to squeeze. You okay. see, this is where we have different cattle in different places, but the one thing you do need is a non-slip floor. Okay. I cannot emphasize how important a non-slip floor is because you can get these little slips where they just sort of do this 
and then pull a foot back and they just go berserk. Um, yeah, really tame cattle, you don't need to need to squeeze. Like you probably right. don't need the head restrainer. Okay. His next question is to improve and anticipate the vaccination response after arrival. What is your opinion about uh, intranasal vaccination and this approach? Is, is this approach often used in the U.S. or not? Yes, we use intranasal vaccines. Yes, that, that's, that's common. Okay. Next question comes from Pete. Are robotic milking systems better for animal welfare than traditional milking parlors? Well, there's some real advantages where I think that they can be an advantage is that um, is it enables somebody to have a, you know, a, maybe 200 cows, you know, not a gigantic dairy, 200 cows and not have to deal with hiring labor. That can be a big advantage. It also gives the dairy producer more flexibility. I had a very interesting trip. I went up to Canada. The robots had just, you know, were coming in, went to four different dairies and I had all four of the dairy families tell me that what they really liked is I could go to my kid's sporting event. I could go to my, my child's school play or some other thing because it wasn't tied down to that, you know, twice a day milking schedule. And it, they said it enabled them to stay in dairying. Now it's not automatic management. I got to emphasize that. And they are a high maintenance, complex thing. And I often get asked, well, which brand should I get? I'll tell you, get the brand that has the best service people. Mm-hmm. I say the same thing about electronic scales. Go to the scale company that has the best service. I'm going to buy the brand that's the best dealer and the best service department. Yep. Dr. Grandin, we have a lot of questions and we're past the top of the hour. Do you have a, a few I more minutes stay. to hang I, on? I, I can stay a while longer. All right. Very well. Next question comes in from Laura. Do you have uh, examples of dairy farms using animal handling measurables uh, like slipping, balking, or any parlor entry or headlock measurables? Well, you can use slipping and falling with, with any, with any in, a, in, a, in a dairy. Yeah, slipping, and that's also measured in beef. You can measure slipping, you can measure falling, balking, or stopping, because the translation software won't understand what balking is. Stopping, yes. And that's um, also used in the in European welfare quality. Welfare quality has some very nice scoring tools. Now, their way of mathematically aggregating the scores, I don't agree with that. But uh, stopping is one of the things that they measure. Now, you can measure that. Now, a new heifer is going to stop more. And the important thing is if she stops at a drain on the floor or a sharp shadow, let her put her head down and look at that. Wait for that head to come back up. Then you push her. But if you push her when the head's down, she's going to turn back on you or just not want to go because she wants to look at that. Cattle have poor depth perception. So if they go to a new place where there's a shadow, they're not sure if it might be a hole in the ground. That's why they're looking at it. They wouldn't mm-hmm. want to step in a hole. Yeah. The experienced cow is just going to walk over it. Mm-hmm. Next question comes in from Jeffrey. One area of livestock handling uh, that the consumer is likely to see is transportation going down the highway. Are there strategies one can do to improve the stress of transportation, especially those animals that are moving a long distance to a raising facility? Well, don't overload trucks. Uh, the other thing that's really important is good driving. There's been quite a lot of research on this. If the driver stomps on the brakes, uh, stomps on the gas, on the, on the accelerator pedal, so you're doing a lot of sudden starts and sudden stops, you're going to throw cattle off balance. Good driving matters. The other thing we got to worry about is tired driving. Uh, Jennifer Woods in Canada was uh, looking at trucking accidents and it uh, doesn't matter what the species is. But early in the morning, like three o'clock in the morning, there was a truck that would just go off the road and then tip over. And that was a driver that was falling asleep. So this brings up another thing is make sure your drivers are on a reasonable schedule so they actually have time to sleep. And then, of course, really good loading facilities with good non-slip flooring. And I've got a lot of information in that in in, uh, in both of my books. The, this is, a, you know, both of these books right here have designs for loading ramps. 
um, really good non-slip flooring. And for a concrete ramp, I show stair step design that works very nicely for dairy cattle. Now, if you just use what they call cleats, you need to make sure that they're spaced so the hoof can fit right down in between the cleats. If you have them too far apart, they slip. Um, but good loading ramp with good non-slip footing. I mean, lots of times we have to just worry about these most basic things. And the problem with flooring is it wears out and it wears out slowly. So people don't realize how much it's wearing out. Okay. Next question comes in from uh, Stefano. <clears throat> uh, um, how often do you think personnel should be trained to apply uh, efficient handling management practices uh, that you suggested in your presentation? Would you suggest a plan on introductory training for new employees as well? Yes, absolutely. The new employees is where it's the most important to do the training is with your new employees. Now, it's going to get rather boring for your experienced employees every year to watch the same video on handling. That's really boring. But the new employees definitely should be trained. The other thing is constant supervision. Uh, one of the things that's been a big issue is broken tails. Um, one of my um, students is now doing welfare audits on dairies. And uh, I've had two students work on that and way too many broken tails. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely not acceptable the break tails on dairy cattle. Mm -hmm. Also, they you know, a lot of the guidelines now, they're not, uh, you know, docking the tails anymore. I'm glad to see that gone. But you constantly have to monitor because it's like the highway or the motorway, as it's called in Europe. Uh, if the police did not monitor speeding, you'd have a racetrack. If the police didn't monitor drunk driving, you'd be having terrible accidents. You constantly have to monitor handling. We had a horrible um, situation in the U.S. with calf abuse. And the owner of the dairy came on YouTube and said, training's not enough. He realized you have to monitor it. Hmm. Constantly have to monitor it. Yeah. Also, another thing I have found, and this is not very nice, is there's certain people that probably should not be handling calf. They can work in a feed mill, something, but not be actually actively handling cattle. They tend to get mad at them. And there's some people that, this is not nice to say, that enjoy herding cattle. They just should not be there. And this may be 10% of people. Mm -hmm. And they could have some job on the dairy, like the, making the feed, but not working with the cows. Yeah. Great points. You know, the dairy industry is going through a lot of changes right now with a lot of consolidation, more animals per herd. Um, have you been involved in designing uh, any dairy facilities? And um, if you were to design new dairy facilities, these larger facilities, what are some of the big things that you might want uh, designers to consider? Well, a lot of the rotary parlors and things like that work really well. Now, let's make sure we don't do basics. I went to another country. I think we'll leave out the name of the country. But they didn't build the foundation correctly for Rotary Parlor, and it collapsed. I mean, let's not make those kind of stupid mistakes. But one of the things that concerns me about um, uh, big dairies is the stockmanship. I uh, To have good stockmanship, you need to give that, that stock person a piece of that dairy that's his or hers that belongs to that person you know they do that in big huge feedlots you know where maybe one pen rider has got this set of pens somebody else has another set of pens so they have a piece of that operation that belongs to that person and that will help on the stockmanship mm -hmm. and the other thing i've been doing a lot of thinking about is um the future of animal egg you know we've got big tech investors putting money into um, into growing meat and milk and maybe in fermentation vats, bioreactors, um, making milk out of, I uh, went into the grocery store the other day and there was like eight different kinds of milk made out of nuts, which I can tell you is not very sustainable. Almond milk is not a sustainable product because almonds are a water pig. Um, all these different kinds of things and what's going to be the future of animal egg? And we have got to do things to improve uh, uh, animal welfare. 
And one of the big concerns a lot of the public has is natural living. And, you know, dairy cows out on pasture, that's great. And I'm thinking about, I've been in this industry 50 years. I can remember when cattle handling was absolutely terrible. You know, now that is something that's gotten a lot better, but now I'm, but then in the last 15 years, seen more problems with genetics, things like a leg confirmation. That's a genetic issue. I got to have an animal that walks. Um, and, and we have 20% of the earth's surface that's grazing. I, I'm going to have to raise food on that. I'm getting very concerned about soil health. I'm thinking about, is there a future? Is everything I've spent 50 years of my career doing going to become obsolete? That has crossed my mind. Hmm. I'll be 75 in August. Won't hmm. have to take the shoes off. You look great. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I, so I've been looking at a lot of this stuff on crop rotation, getting cattle on, you know, rotating with crops, getting away from monoculture, soil health, regenerative agriculture, and doing it right. And uh, if you graze them, I, I think you got a great future. Now, I know that's not going to work for, for everything. I, I'd be inclined to some of these big dairies to break it up into smaller units. It's going to be better from the stockmanship where maybe it's a, you know, a, no more than a thousand cows at one place. Mm -hmm. Simply for the management. And if people think they can monitor everything with drones, and all this uh, electronic bracelets. My student's project was done during lockdown with COVID. That's two years ago. I'm not talking about something I did 50 years ago. She did that project now. And those computer interface was absolutely useless hmm. for the dairy producer. Hmm. I they can't, you can't even use the data. Uh, Dr. Uh, Grandin, we're getting uh, quite a few questions on on robotic milkers. Uh, oh. The next one comes in from Felipe and, and robots. Does the cow prefer to enter the robot from the side, like the left or right, or no difference between them um, and the robot? Is there any issues with the robot manger that um, could cover so that the animal can't see around when she eats? Well, I think the most important thing is, okay, you get a brand of these things. And then the cows get used to them. And then if you're switching brands where well, they work slightly different, then the cows aren't going to know what to do. And and uh, the other thing is taking the time to, to uh, train your heifers. And you can get dummy robotic units that don't milk, but they have the gates and the feed trough and work on the training. And I'll be perfectly honest, I haven't studied all the exact details. Um, um, when I did my uh, welfare book, I did a, a you know reviewed the literature, and it wasn't too much on the different different kinds of robotic milking units. I but I have to look at a lot of things because if I buy it where I don't have any service for fixing it, it's not going to work. And and the maintenance of this equipment is just so important because none of them are going to work right if they're not if they're not maintained. Mm -hmm. But I, one thing I like about that is uh, you can have you can have smaller dairies where they don't have to deal with the labor issues. And I think another thing that'd be good from the human labor standpoint would be robotic milking in a big rotary, because um, lifting up all those claws, uh, it's uh, really bad from a carpal tunnel repetitive motion in, uh, injuries. It's not a job I want to do. I think yeah. a robot needs to do that yeah. and let the people work on the stockmanship and let the machine do the repetitive boring work. I just read an article in my brand new business week on robots and factories. And there's a company that's specializing on robots to do the really repetitive stuff for different industries, like taking finished product. I don't care if it's food or it's, or it's door hinges, but taking those finished products and putting them in boxes, which is very boring, repetitive work. And, right. and I'd like to see the robot do that. Then the people need to concentrate on spending more time with their cows and on the stock machine. These yeah. things are not automatic management. Yeah. Thank you for that. Our last is not a question, but actually a comment comes in from Sarah. Sarah Stemple, you are a phenomenal person and one of my heroes in the industry. Thank you for being such a great role model. And so I think that... Uh, 
uh, that, that, that goes for all of us, uh, Dr. Grant, and we really appreciate you coming here today. Um, we didn't get to all the questions, but what I will say is that we do have a podcast called Real Science Exchange. Um, uh, Dr. Grannon has agreed to come on that, and we will attempt to uh, answer those questions during, during the podcast. So with that, I want to thank you, Dr. Grandin, and I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. The Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues next week, April 12th, with Dr. Uh, Dorte Diaz from the University of uh, Arizona, and he'll review what we know about mold, plant, and animal interactions um, in his talk, The Wonderful World of Fungal Toxins. On April 19th, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Eric Ciapio about the interactions between nutrition and animal cognition, sharing about how diet can help to make animals smarter. Visit balkim.com slash real science for more details and to register. Balkim's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform or visit balkim.com slash podcast. Subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and your shirt size, and we'll send you a really cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt. On behalf of Bao Kim and Dr. Grandin, thank you for joining us today. Well, it was wonderful to be here today, and thank you for having me. Oh, thank you very much.